turning this evening to Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 5 and verse 1. 2 Corinthians, chapter 5, verse 1. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Remarkable words and very famous words of the Apostle Paul, written in this second letter to the Corinthians, late in the year AD 52, perhaps the very beginning of AD 53, some three to four years after he had been there preaching the gospel, founding the church, evangelizing among them. And he taught them about salvation and about heaven, about eternal life. So they know about these things. They're a church of believers. And so he can speak to people who already know the teaching. And he reminds them. And then he tells them wonderful things about eternal life. So the concept of eternal life is our subject in the next few moments. For we know that if our earthly house, the present body, our earthly house of this tabernacle, tent, that means the, the body just illustrated in terms of a tent, were dissolved. The Greek is literally loosed, loosed, so that all the rigidity goes out to the body. All the tension and the firmness just goes and there's complete collapse. That's the way in which the apostle describes it. If we die suddenly in that manner, we have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Can you see the contrast in the verse before I proceed? For we know that if our earthly house, yes, but it isn't much of a house because it's of this tabernacle, of this tent, that's all it is, a fragile tent, the body. We know that if it were dissolved, we have a building. That's better than a tent. On earth, the body is as fragile as a tent. In heaven, it's a different existence. It's something secure and definite and firm. And house not made with hands, made by God, that is, made by divine power, and it's eternal, and it's in the best imaginable location. It's in the heavens, in the heavenly glory. What a contrast from a tent to a building in heaven. That's the picture language that the apostle employs to catch the contrast. Well, from ancient times, this has been the teaching that life, may be followed by eternal life, but only on certain conditions and terms. That's the teaching of the Bible. The teaching of eternal life goes back to the beginning of the Bible. The Bible has been called the book of eternal life. It begins the very opening pages. It begins with the tree of life contrasted with the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which leads to death. So life that is eternal death, a cessation of life or death and punishment by God, those are the contrasts from the beginning of the Bible to the very end. I've heard somebody say there is not much about heaven in the Old Testament of the Bible. You catch your breath when anyone exposes such unawareness or ignorance of what the Bible contains. This is the book of the life hereafter, of eternal life. To all the pages of the Bible, there is a consistent cable of teaching about the afterlife, about eternal life. The tree of life I've already mentioned, and pick it up from there. 
all the way through the Old Testament. You come to the Psalms of David, and there are so many Psalms which are about eternity and about eternal life. The Bible is full of it. But I'm going to do something unusual. You didn't know it, but when you came to the service tonight, you were coming to something which might resemble a funeral. Because I thought, well, the best way of telling you about the teaching of Christ on eternal life is to read some of those great verses from Scripture that we read always at funeral services. And here are some. Just listen to these remarkable words. Here are the promises of Christ. I'm not going to give you chapter and verse. They're just selected. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. Here's another. I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. And Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. And this is the Father's will, that everyone who looks to the Son and believes on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. And here is another. Verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. And again, I lay down my life for the sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any pluck them out of my hand. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth on me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth on me shall never die. Because I live, said Christ, ye shall live also. Listen to these beautiful words. Let not your heart be troubled. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And then these words spake Jesus, and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am. Those are just some of the promises of Christ, that whoever believes in him as Saviour, that he suffered and died for sinners who believe in him and come to him, have eternal life. And can I read one or two? Though I usually preach, not read, but here are some words from the Apostle Paul. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. If the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Then there are those wonderful words in Romans, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors 
through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And then passages that we have already read in our, or will read in, as we go through this 2 Corinthians chapter 5 passage in the course of this evening. So right through the Bible, there is the teaching about eternal life for those who trust in the savior of the world. There's a remarkable little text in the book of Ecclesiastes and in chapter three, verse 11, which is perhaps one of those rare verses strangely translated in our King James Version, where it says, he hath set the world in their heart. God has set the world in the heart of men and women. But all your modern translations will do much better on that because they will say, he, God, hath set eternity in their heart. And that is a much better translation of the Hebrew. The word in the Hebrew refers to that which is veiled from sight. He hath set in the heart of men and women that which is veiled from their sight. Another way of translating it is this, that which is beyond the vanishing point. That's the poetry of the original word. In other words, eternity. Everybody has an instinct for eternity. That is why people who are not believers at all in God and have no time for him, when people around them die, they start talking about uh, them being on high and able to look down and to see them. People instinctively think there is an afterlife. You have to train yourself not to believe in the afterlife. You have to persuade yourself that there is no spiritual realm. The natural thing is for you to have that instinct. Of course, when people think that everybody has an afterlife, which is happy and glorious, they're deeply mistaken because the Bible and Christ and all the authority of the scripture says no. We are naturally cut off from God and offensive to him and condemned by him because of our disobedience and our sin. And we need a savior and we need his forgiving love. And then we have all those promises of the afterlife and of heaven. And so the Apostle Paul says here, for we know that if our earthly house, our present feeble body were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands, dissolved, loosed, overthrown. The word hints at something sudden. Now death may appear to be slow. The process of death may appear to be slow with organ failure and so on and all those things. But no, there's a moment when the soul takes flight and the individual stands before God in judgment. There's a moment, you may resist it. We may do everything we can to avoid it. Some people may be terrified of it, but when that moment comes, it's out of our control and it's sudden. And that's reflected in these words. For we know that if our earthly house were dissolved, loosed, suddenly, that's the process of death. We have a building of God. If you're saved, if your sins are forgiven, if you're trusting in Christ, it's already provided. There's a new existence. You pass from death to life. Your soul leaves its body behind. And one day there'll be a glorified body, an amazing spiritual yet physical glorified body for all believers. So teaches the scripture. An house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. 
beyond human power of description. We have many, many hints in the scripture of what heaven is like, but we don't have an exact description. If we had such a thing, if it were possible in human speech, we wouldn't understand it. It is too glorious. It is too wonderful, too amazing to be described. But I want to tell you about some of the passages here. Verse 2, the Apostle Paul says, for in this present body we groan. We groan. The Greek word is, we feel hemmed in. It's the narrowing word in the Greek. We feel pressured and hemmed in. Believers do. There are many happy things in life. There are wonderful things, but at the same time, we feel under a certain pressure and hemmed in to be limited by this material world. When sins are forgiven and one day we shall be going to heaven, where there is glorious liberty and absolute purity and perfection and infinite understanding and activities beyond human description and the very sight and presence of Almighty God and the whole atmosphere is full of love and happiness and fellowship. Why we feel so limited in this poor world, this present material existence with sin and sickness and weakness and so many problems. For in this we feel so limited. Our translators have translated it in one word, we groan or sigh. But the original indicates where we are so restricted, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon which our house which is from heaven. See, when your sins are forgiven, and when you can pray and when you can walk with God and you prove him and you know him, you know that that future life is so glorious. There are times when you can only imagine being, what a term this is, clothed upon. Elsewhere, the apostle says, swallowed up of life, just engulfed by life. That's the experience of going to glory, of going to heaven. And he says this in verse 3, which doesn't read terribly well, but it's a marvellous sentiment. If so be, if we are truly Christians, he means that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. It's actually an affirmation. If we're saved, when being clothed, we shall never be destitute. Look at death. What does death do to you? It takes. It takes everything. If you become comfortably off, it rips away from you all your possessions. If you were healthy and vigorous before your last illness or death, it takes away your health and your strength. It strips you of life itself. It's a taker. It takes everything and strips you down to the bone and to absolutely nothing, death. Ah, but if you have the forgiveness of God, and you have eternal life, you're clothed upon with something much more magnificent, a life more magnificent than you ever had before. We shall not be found stripped, destitute, disappointed, naked. As you die, you go from death into eternal spiritual wealth and glory. That's the sense, really, of verse 3. For we that are in this tabernacle, not this tabernacle, this tent of the body Paul is talking about, for we that are in this present bodily tent do sigh and desire, being burdened, so that, and look at the end of the verse, mortality might be swallowed up of life. This dying frame might suddenly be overtaken by a great rush of light and understanding and life and purity and wonder and vigor entering in to the portals of eternal glory. You're swallowed up in one gulp almost is the sense. Now he, verse 5, that hath wrought us 
for the self-same thing, this very experience, is God who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. For those who believe, God has planned it all. For those who have come to Christ, God has it all ready and planned for us. But here's a new point. What's the proof? Is there any certainty? Is there any certainty? Yes, says the Apostle Paul. Now he that hath wrought us for this is God, and listen, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. And the word translated earnest means the pledge of the Spirit of God. It's often translated as the deposit, the down payment. That's what it means. That's what the pledge was in Bible times. You were going to buy something. You made a down payment, not because it was going to be HP or mortgage or installments, but until the deal was finally settled, that was your earnest, your pledge. You made a down payment and that committed you. Such as when you buy a flat or a house, you get to the point of changing contracts, your deposit commits you. It's an earnest, not just a deposit because you're going to pay over time. It, it seals the deal effectively and commits you to it. And that's what this means. God gives you a pledge, a share, something which is definite, which is, uh, reflects the rest. If it's a down payment of money, you know you're going to get paid the whole amount that you're due when the transaction takes place. If God is going to give you eternal life, he will give you a special portion of life now as a down payment, as a pledge. It's nothing like the real thing, but it's a share. It's a pledge, an earnest. If God is going to give you fellowship with himself in heaven, and you'll walk with him and know him, and call upon him and hear him and love him. He is going to give you a little portion of that when you're converted, even now, so that you have a real sense of communion with him. And he answers your stub stumbling prayers and blesses you and proves himself to you. This is a pledge. Everything you'll have eternally, you get a small installment of to prove that it's coming. Did you know that that's what conversion was? When you're converted to God, your life is changed. He changes you by work of the Spirit within. And it's just a portion, a fraction, a down payment, a pledge, an earnest of the abundance that will be your experience when you die and you enter into glory. You get a measure of certainty now. You get a measure of joy and peace when you come to Christ one moment. Oh, will God forgive my sins? Will he receive me? Will he change my life? I call upon him, Lord, forgive me. I trust in Christ alone. Lord, give me life. Change my life. One moment I'm uncertain, and then I know he's blessed me. I can see the evidence of the change within I look at everything so differently. I want to please him. I hate my sin. I hunger and thirst after righteousness. I pray to him and he answers me. Don't you see this is all the first installment, the earnest, the assurance, the proof that everything is coming. Oh, you say, I wanted the proof a different way. I wanted a bolt of lightning from heaven. I wanted to see some fantastic miracle. Well, it is a miracle. What he does for you and what he does within you as he gives you that portion in conversion of the, in character, in nature of what will one day follow. And that's what the Apostle Paul mentions here in verse 5. Now he that hath wrought us, that's a reference to conversion, probably. For the self-same thing, for eternal life, 
is God. He's done it. Who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. The Apostle Paul uses that term in chapter 1 of this very epistle. In another epistle, his epistle to the Ephesians, he actually calls it the earnest of the inheritance, the pledge of the inheritance which is to follow. That's wonderful. There is a proof of heaven. When I am converted, the experience that I receive is just a pledge to me of what is to follow. So I have certain anticipation, a certain hope that one day I am going to heaven. I walk with the Lord now, we say. I prove him now. As the years go by, you become so certain of him. You have so much evidence. You feel such love to him and such gratitude. Your eyes are opened. Why? Just take this part of the earnest. In heaven you'll know all things. There'll be wonderful things that you can see and grasp. But look what happens to your conversion. There is a sudden explosion of knowledge in your mind. You can see through the world. You can see and understand what the scripture teaches. The Apostle Paul is going to say in a few moments, we walk by faith, not by sight. It's there in verse 7. By faith, not by sight. Some people, they think, oh, that means you... you Blind faith. If I trust in Christ and repent of my sin and believe in him, I shall walk by blind faith, just hoping against hope that all these things are true. It doesn't mean that at all. By faith, it means that you see more than you see by sight. By ordinary sight, all you see is material things. By faith. You understand spiritual things. By sight, you see material objects. You see the world. You do your best to understand it, and you can't. But by faith, you get God's explanation for it all. And you understand that. It's a higher level of understanding. Look, it's, it's like taking a journey and using a map. Your map is the word of God. As you look at, for the, at the signs on the map and the routing and so on, and you follow the map, you're hiking or something of that kind, you suddenly realize, oh look, just ahead, there's that railway line, just as it is on the map. And look over there, there's a river, just as it is on the map. And looking at the contours, there's a steep hill. And there's a, a church, as marked on the map, I can see the tower. And as you proceed on your journey, guided by the map, all the things that are on the map come one after the other into your view. That is what it is to walk by faith. You believe the scripture, and the scripture tells you exactly what is going on in this world and why, that man is fallen because of his sin and disobedience to God. Therefore, gen generally speaking, man will always behave in a selfish and often a warlike way, and there will be wars and rumors of wars. And however optimistic, suddenly what something goes wrong in this part of the world, then in that part of the world, and it's never ending, and it's ongoing, and you look at your map, which is the scripture, well, this is exactly how the scripture says it will be. Human wisdom, which is just by sight, may be very optimistic, but it gets it all wrong. The human politician, and we need them, we pray for them, we trust they're trying to run our country and so on, but the human politician, he may have nothing but optimism. Watch me, I'm going to achieve this, achieve that, achieve, and he achieves none of these things. But we look at the scripture and we see why. Things unfold just as the Bible says. That's what it means to walk by faith. It means to be using the map of God. And God gives you an understanding mind. And that's just a down payment. Why? I never 
grasp what was going on. I never saw through people's dishonesty. I was quite a naive person, you might say to yourself, but since I've been converted, I see. I've had a down payment of the knowledge that God will give me in the afterlife. I understand the scripture. I see what Christ has done. I marvel at his sacrifice on Calvary. I now understand what it was all about. I understand God's plans and how things will unfold. This is just a down payment. So there is not only an afterlife for Christian people, that is those who repent of sin, humble themselves, seek the Lord, come to him, ask for salvation. You get conversion and a new life, which includes a kind of down payment or little portion or an earnest or a pledge of all the things that will be immensely expanded in eternity when we go to heaven. So you say, yes, God has given what he promised. I have that down payment. I know that these things are true. I know that I'm on the way to eternal glory and to heaven. Dear friends, I'm out of my time. Can I just direct attention quickly as we close? Verse 11, we looked at it this morning in a different context. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, said the apostle. Oh, we do have to persuade people to come to Christ because they don't want to do so. We do have to plead with people because they love sin and they trust material things and they don't want to come under the government of God. And sin gets hold of their lives and rules them. I was reading the other day an illustration of Martin Luther about sin. Sin and temptation is like one of those beautiful, expensive cats, he said. One of those Siamese, I suppose, or something exotic, so smooth, so lustrous, and the cat seems docile. And you stroke it, it's so wonderful to the touch, and the animal purrs, it's so attractive. Aha, but this is a nasty-natured one. And go just a little too far, and suddenly out come the claws. And they're in you, embedded in you. And it's painful, and you can't get away. And all of them come at you. That's sin. We have to persuade people. I don't want God. I don't want to repent. I don't want forgiveness. I don't want conversion. I'm not interested in your talk about eternal life. I love the things that I'm getting involved in. I love myself. I love my pleasures, pleasures that you wouldn't approve of. I love these things. They're nice. I enjoy them. They're my indulgences. I live for them. Yes, but out will come the claw. And sin will grab hold of you. And it will overpower you. And you can't get rid of it, and it'll rule your life, and it'll take you down to hell and to eternal judgment. Dear friends, says Paul, we persuade men and women. May the Holy Spirit work in hearts so that that human persuasion which would not work without the Spirit of God touches your heart and affects you. And you see the foolishness, the terrible eternal foolishness of being without God and without his love and without his forgiveness and without his converting power and without new life and without eternal hope. You need to come to him. That's Second Corinthians chapter 5, dear friends. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature is wonderful and here the apostle deals with the atoning death of Christ on which we depend the love of Christ to take our sins and our punishment in our place that is 
on behalf of all who are the redeemed, in whose hearts God will work, who will be drawn to him. Let's pray together. O oh God, our gracious Heavenly Father, deal tenderly with us. How foolish we are by nature. O oh Lord, in thy great mercy, touch our hearts. Draw us to Christ and to Calvary. Bring us to trust in him and to come in repentance and faith. O oh Lord, come down in our midst and save souls that all may be sure of that great and coming glory that entrance into heaven, covered by the atoning death of Christ and his mercy and love, work in every heart. Draw us near, we pray. We ask these things in the name of our Saviour and for his sake. Amen. Amen.